Good morning. It's good to see all of you, and it's good to see everybody online who happens to uh, dial in, view, view this session. Over these next two weeks, we're going to really attempt to do two things. The parishes are going to be here today to really encourage you with their personal testimonies of both walking through grief, but then also uh, finding the hope and uh, sort of the encouragement that they found themselves through something called Grief Share Ministry. And then real, that might fit into uh, maybe some of you in your lives. Some of you are coming alongside others. Some of you who are uh, in this season. And again, some of you online who may uh, need to look at this at any time. And then next week, just a wonderful teaching. I've seen bits and pieces of it already. Uh, Sue Glad is going to share really the current season of grief to a degree and how she's moved through this over this past year. And uh, look at it as she has viewed it through the eyes of Naomi. And scripture as well. So I do want to encourage you uh, after this week to uh, consider coming back. And also, if you haven't had a chance to, to see Pastor Sonny's sermon, please take a few moments to watch that sermon. And finally, we do have some resources at the Resource Center for Grief. We've got four titles. We've had to reorder a couple of them now twice. I've got to reorder again, Grief Observed. If you think that might be helpful, take a look. We have a copy of each of those in our library as well, if you just want to check one out uh, and not, um, not have to, to purchase purchase or gift it. So with that, uh, I do want to uh, introduce Danny and Jenny Parrish. Uh, the parishes have uh, really um, been at River Oaks for eight, nine, ten years-ish, somewhere in there. I know with me about that same time. Um, and um, really were instrumental in, in the formation and the start of our deacons ministry. Uh, I would say we think of you two as really being uh, some real fuel behind those early years of getting deacons ministries going. And also, as you're going to learn, have a real heart uh, for coming alongside those that are in a season of grief, really a lot based on their own experiences. And so without any more from me, I would like you just to welcome Jenny Parrish to begin this, uh, this, this season, this equipping class today. So thank you, Jenny. Come on up. <laughs> okay. Um... David wanted to give us an introduction to how, um, I guess, our grief journey. So I'll start, and Danny will tell you a little bit about his. I um, married in 1989 a man who had been serving in Nigeria as a Bible teacher at a Bible college. He was training pastors who had a passion for going back to their individual villages and planting churches. So that's what he was doing. He came home to raise support. Ended up at our church asking for money, and I fell in love. <laughs> uh, so we were married in March of 1989 and uh, went to Nigeria. And then in November of 89, I buried him. He, um, we had a missionary couple, excuse me, a couple from our former church coming to visit and do some work on the at the campus where we were. And we were getting the house ready for them that they would be staying in. And he was working on a stove that wasn't working and our generator popped on at the same time he was working on it. So he was electrocuted. And uh, it, was, it, it was very tragic. And I have to tell you, there were two other missionary couples with me at the time. One from California, one from Pennsylvania. And the loneliness, as you can imagine, of not being with your family when you lost your spouse. Granted, uh, we weren't married that long, but we, the loss was still great. Uh, the investment that we had in each other and what we were doing. So um, I've heard people say as they're struggling with grief, you know, I just, I'm mad at God and I'm going to give up on my faith. And at that time, I remember thinking, how, how could people give up on God? He's my rock right now. He's the only thing I have. So I remember praying and asking God to give me a verse to cling to. I mean, the Bible's full of them. But I wanted one that he had for me. And I, I stumbled upon one I know I've read several times, and I'm sure you all are familiar with, 2 Corinthians 1, 3-7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions so that we can comfort others with the comfort with which God has comforted us. Because we know the suffering, let's see how is it, we identify with this, for just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant, 
so are the, is the comfort in Christ. And that ministered to me. That isn't a verse that would minister to everybody, but that's what God gave me, and I hung on to that. So fast forward, I'm back in Winston-Salem, and I uh, was invited to a, a grief group where Danny was a member and met him. And uh, we married a year later, and uh, that's our story. So how we intersected with Grief Share, we were at a church where there was a couple who had lost their grandson in an accident in terrible grief, just could not get over it, and found a support group called Grief Share. This was back in 1999, 2000. And it was not offered at our church, but they went to another church to go through this support group, came back to our pastoral care minister and said, we need this. Name somebody that you know that has not experienced loss recently. And I look out at those of you that I know your stories and the loss that you've had in the past couple of years or in the past, whether it's a family member or friend, um, Grief is something we're all going to experience. Um, so uh, the pastor decided we needed to have that ministry. So he gathered those of us who had had loss. We went through some of the sessions together and planned how we were going to do it. And I think we did it for maybe 10, 12 years. And um, it was, I just have to tell you, the Grief Share program was put together by an organization called Church Initiative. They're out of Wake Forest, North Carolina. The Grief Share, the very first iteration of Grief Share was 1998. And I think they're on their fourth revision. They go in and update people so they have fresh glasses and hairstyles and ties so it looks more current. But if you can look past that, the wisdom of what the people share, they have experts, counselors, pastors, who give you a two or three minute vignette, or even less, just sharing wisdom that they have, godly wisdom. Then there's lay people just like you all who share their journey in a, in a very brief way. And as facilitators, as we would look around the group, we would see people going, just nodding at the screen. It was so beautiful to see what was happening. And to back up, one of the, I guess, the pivotal thing that uh, Grief Share offers is the focus on a relationship with Christ being the way to hope and healing, not just going through the steps of grief, because we know they're not organized. Just like Sonny talked about a couple weeks ago, he had a great message. If you missed that, you need to go back and watch it. There are no organized steps to grief. But as, as people came and watched the wisdom and listened to what was being said, they could, I guess, bring it into their lives and apply it. It was funny, we would have people say, you know, I went through it once. I feel like I need to come back. And at the end of the first session, they'd say, I know I was here for this, but I don't remember any of this. It's because of the fog. You're just in a fog when you're in grief. You're not connected. You're not aware of what's going on all the time because you're grieving. And grieving, what we learn, is not, when you're in a grieving mode, that's not the best time to be learning the steps of grief. You're just feeling. You're feeling all kinds of stuff all the time. And people are saying, when are you going to come back to choir? How come you're still crying? You're still going to the cemetery? People are saying very um, insensitive things to you. And uh, as <laughs> you sometimes have to overlook their best efforts at trying to comfort you or urge you along. They want to do things on their timetable. And as you know, grief doesn't have a timetable. It's all individual. You know, you and I were just talking, Jason, about how your mom is grieving differently than you are for the loss of your stepdad. It's, it's just everybody's grief is different. You can't challenge it. But back to grief share. Uh, what a typical grief share session looks like. You come, there is a workbook. I've got one here. A workbook that has uh, questions and guidance for each uh, lesson that you go through. It's a little bit like our small groups. 
you watch the video, um, and then through the week you work on the questions that were posed during the video and kind of write down your thoughts and your feelings of what meant something to you. So we have the video, we have the workbook, and then the group session. So the group session, you sit around, and I know in our group what we would do is um, you would introduce yourself, you would briefly share your loss, and then you would say what your favorite breakfast cereal was, you know, something innocuous. And then, you know, there are people that are coming to Grief Share that may not be church, may not know anyone there, and may be very shy. So the rule was, if you don't want to, if it's your turn and you don't want to say anything, you just tap the person on the shoulder and they go next. So it's, Grief Share is a very, it's, it's beautiful because it, it unfolds at your pace. You can contribute as much as you want or as little as you want. The videos are topics like guilt and anger, feelings of suicide, how to encourage others in their journey of grief, challenges, now what, heaven, uh, and just so well done. The people that they have sharing these things know what they're talking about. And that is uh, pivotal for people that are going through grief. They want to talk to somebody who's navigated and gone through it and, and has survived it. So um, the website for GriefShare is griefshare.org. And on that, you can sign up for daily encouraging emails. If you belong to an active group, you can actually see videos that you may have missed. Go back and watch them again. Just some um, tips that were offered. Uh, don't ask them how they are, because as you know, they want to hear the word fine. They, they don't want to go into a lot of detail. So don't ask people how they're doing. Ask if they're getting more rest. I know you mentioned you're not getting a, a lot of rest. Are you getting more rest? So don't push people. Be careful about pushing people to do things. And then there's some other people that may need a little push now and then. Uh, it's been a year. How come you're not over it? Everybody's time table is different, especially for those who shove it down, who don't want to deal with it right then. They think, busy, busy, busy. I talked to somebody just recently who lost her husband who said, I, I kind of feel guilty for not doing things. My husband and I did a lot of things, and I find myself just wanting to sit. Is that normal? I'm like, yes, that's very normal. You need time to grieve that grieve that busyness may be preventing you from doing it. Process it now so you're not dealing with it two years later. But we had the girl come and say, for a year after her mother died, she worked at a grocery store. And people would say, how's your mom doing? She's fine. She couldn't talk about it. She acted like her mom was still alive until she decided to deal with it. And it was almost a year later. And people would come up and say, I heard your mom died. We didn't know anything about it. And then, you know, she would crumble. So um, the other important thing they talk about is being ambushed by grief. I know Sunny talked about that. Uh, where you're, remember Elizabeth Elliott talking about being in the grocery store. And the cereal aisle, and looking up and seeing, now she buried three husbands. I don't know how she kept them all, fit, all, all separate in her mind, but one of her husbands had a favorite cereal. When she saw it, she just fell apart and left her cart in the store and left. She couldn't, it's, it's an ambush at the grocery store. Who would expect it? A song that comes on the radio, um, Things like that. So things to do rather than not to do. Ask people how you can pray for them. If they mention that they've had trouble sleeping or they have to settle their husband's estate or their dad's estate, um, ask if how they you know ask specifically how you can help. Don't say um, what can I do for you or how can I come over and help you do something. Say, can I come over and do your laundry? What if I come over and mow the grass? Would you let me do that? Something specific they can respond to. If they have to think, their mind's a jumble already. So um, give them specific things to, to think about. And lastly, I just, as far as grief share goes, and Danny will share more, um, I just can't say enough how helpful it was to the people that we saw come. And what a great ministry opportunity it is. We had a woman come because she had lost her mother. Her ex-husband decided to come and support her. He was not a believer. 
Danny had conversations with him about his relationship with God. And uh, finally, he said, Mike, you keep talking about, you know, this God thing. What's holding you back from making a decision? And he said, I don't know. And Danny got to pray with him. And again, if, if getting over grief depended on you and me helping people, we couldn't do it. It's only God and his Holy Spirit and the beauty of the words in his scripture that can help us get over this. And no, it's not going to happen in a magical number of days. It will be a lifetime of remembering the person that you lost. We loved them. You know, grief is the price you pay for the person that you loved. So um, I just, I can't say enough about it. Um, one of the things that we put together was just a booklet on some, some things that people had donated. Uh, and again, the letter that Sunny read by the woman going through grief that had lost her, one of her children, uh, that was beautiful and so on target about it being an unwelcome friend. You know, it's always there with you when you're, you know, walking through the journey. Um, but let me read this to you. It's called Welcome to Holland. We are often asked to describe what it's like to be a grieving person, to try to help people who have not shared that unique grief experience to understand it, to imagine how it would feel. We think it goes something like this. When you're planning your future, it's like planning a fabulous vacation trip. To Italy, you buy a bunch of guidebooks and make your wonderful plans. The Colosseum, Michelangelo's David, the gondolas in Venice. You even learn some handy phrases in Italian. It's all very exciting. You're ready. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags, gather your ticket and passport, and off you go. Several hours later, the plane ends. The flight attendant cheerfully announces, Welcome to Holland! Holland? What do you mean Holland? I signed up for Italy. All my life I planned to go to Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. And you were not consulted. You've landed in Holland. And there you must stay. The important thing is that they haven't taken you to a horrible place full of famine and pestilence. It's just a different place. So you go out and buy new guidebooks. Learn a whole new language. You'll meet a whole new group of people you would have never met if you'd gone to Italy. It's a different place. It's slower paced and less flashy than in Italy. But after you've been there for a while, you can catch your breath and look around and begin to notice that Holland has windmills, tulips, Rembrandts. But everyone you know is busy coming to and going from Italy. And they're bragging about what a wonderful time they had there. And for the rest of your life, you'll say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go. That's what I planned. The pain of that will never go away because the loss of that dream is a very significant loss. But if you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't get to go to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the special and lovely things about Holland. I immediately went back to work so that I didn't have to think about my father's death. I was very fearful of going through any process that would make me have to revisit my father's death. I was afraid the pain would open a door to something that I couldn't handle. I started experiencing uh, depression. It was slow at first. Um, it began with just overwhelming feelings of being discontent. Um, and it started escalating. And eventually, depression and the emptiness was more overwhelming than the thought of facing the grief.
the process of finally dealing with the grief began with Grief Share. It's very much like going to the ocean and wanting to take a swim. You've got that initial wave that comes at you and then you have to face it, let it come over you, and then you shake yourself off and get ready for the next one. And the process of grief share helped me do that. With each wave that came, with each new lesson that I learned, I was able to let it wash over me, process it, and use it to move forward. I love talking about my father now. I love sharing his stories. I love watching videos. I love looking at the pictures, the memories. He was a wonderful man. Now I feel like having accepted the loss, I can now celebrate the life he had and feel joy for those times. Grief Share is a support group open to men and women dealing with the death of a loved one. To learn more about Grief Share, speak to the Grief Share leader at your church. Um, I am Danny, uh, the other half here with Jenny. And um, like Jenny, back uh, in the late 80s, uh, my wife and I were expecting our first child. We were giddy, excited, um, looking forward to the whole experience. We wanted to have several. And along the way, uh, suddenly a knot came up on my wife's collarbone and went to see the physician. They got her in for a biopsy and uh, she had cancer. Uh, back then they didn't have the chemo that they have now that would save the child. So they tried to shield the little boy um, for the radiation. Went through radiation treatment and a few months later we ended up losing the little boy in the womb and had to go take him. Uh, it was very painful, plus we were dealing with my wife's cancer, trying to support her, trying to, to be what she needed. Um, went through that two years after we'd been through the treatments. Um, the doctor went in to repair her tube so we could have children again. They found more cancer. It was more aggressive and it had spread. And then uh, we had about seven years there of no cancer, and we used every day. Um, and we used what time we had to try to bless the Lord and to try to touch others for the Lord. Then right before Christmas, uh, we came up and she had a knot come back on the other collarbone and in her ribs. We went to see the doctor and he said, let's just wait till after Christmas. We knew, we knew it was a even more aggressive cancer. The odds were like 3% of her surviving it. And I lost her seven months later. But during the time that she was sick, she probably did more ministry than most people do well. We'd be at the hospital, up at Baptist Hospital. The nurses would come in and say, Penny, we've got a lady down the hall that's had a double mastectomy, she's lost her hair. Would you mind spending some time with her? And she would feel terrible, but she would wrap her claws around her head, I called them, put on her makeup, go down. The nurses would set a chair up for me outside the door. And in 10, 15 minutes, you'd hear them giggling and laughing. And the number of times that she and I had to witness to people that were going through their own struggle or to family members. Um, it's just unbelievable that the Lord brought more opportunities to witness in sickness than we probably had in a lifetime of wellness. Well, move on. I was blessed to be at a church where they supported me, loved on me, um, did everything they could to take care of me. Um, and one of the things they did, they started a Sunday school class for widows and widowers. 
And uh, one of the pastors in his wisdom knew of Jenny's loss on the mission field earlier. And um, he, uh, they asked her if she would come help lead and encourage our group. And uh, so I met Jenny, didn't really know her. And then one night we all went to eat, went to a movie together. And the lady that headed up the group, she and her husband had ridden with me, but she left her glasses in my car. So I went out to get them, and while I was out there, everyone had gone in, and the only seat left was at the end of the road next to Jenny. And so it's the first time I really got to talk with her. And I remember sharing with her, you know, how blessed I was to be at a church where I had people that couldn't do enough for me. And here she was, pretty lonely, over in Nigeria with very limited support. And I asked her how she did it, and I'll never forget her response. She said, before I go to bed every night, I bow down, and I ask the Lord to provide me all that I need for the day to come. And when I wake in the morning, I thank Him for the day, and I ask Him to give me strength for the day, and He always did. And when I went home that night, there was just something in her spirit I don't know how to describe. I had everybody trying to set me up. I didn't want to be fixed up. I didn't want any to. And the pastor's wives were the worst ones. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm not trying to get that done. But I met her and a buddy of mine, who was the best man in my wedding to Penny, who passed, called me that night and asked me how my Greek group was going. I told him it was going very well. I told him, matter of fact, um, not ready today, Chip, but when I am, I met a young lady tonight, and if she's available, I'm going to pursue that. What I didn't know is Jenny had gone home that night. Her sister Julie had called her to see how it went with the grief group and asked her, said, well, how did it go? She said, I think I may have met my next husband. <laughs> and it moved on from there. And it's just amazing how God took loss and brokenness and came back and used it to where we've been able to touch hundreds and hundreds of folks through Grief Share. And for 12 years, we helped facilitate that. And there were 12 of the most wonderful years that, that we could have had. The, the Lord uses brokenness and He gives you joy in the end and He can bring wonderful things out of that. Now, I know many of you are early in your grief, but I want to tell you this. A couple of truths here. First of all is that God loves you. We need to know that because there are times we struggle and we're, we're all by ourselves or we're not thinking clearly. And we need to know no matter how tough it is, God loves us. And we've got a Savior that's in our seating for us. The second thing is he made us for relationships. If you pick up that Bible and you start in Genesis and you go to Revelation, you're going to see Almighty God from the creation of you and myself, mankind, the way that he reached out through the ages, trying to build relationships with the people of his creation the people he loves, all the way to, to Revelation. It's consistent. So, number one, don't isolate yourself. Don't isolate yourself. God made us for relationships. And it, the good thing about grief share is when we gather in that circle and you begin to share as you feel comfortable, and as God prompts you, you begin to meet other people. You begin to understand their losses. You begin to understand their hurts. And some of the best friendships we know of come out of those groups. And I can tell you this, that once you're healed, once you've been through this and you're healed, God is going to use you to heal others. You have um, a unique standing that those that haven't experienced what you have can never have. 
And God will use it if you'll just surrender that to him. Um, there's just one or two other things. I, I heard it stated this way about grief. Grief is a journey. And it's always like going through a long tunnel. But the neat thing is once you start the journey, you're already on your way. You're on your way out on the other end. Um, I'm not going to belabor this except to say, allow the Lord to use your grief. Don't shut yourself away. Allow yourself to be available to those other people in your life that need your touch, that need your love. And Jenny approached it earlier, but everybody grieves differently. You lose a gentleman that may be a husband to one, a grandfather to another, a brother to somebody else. It's the same individual, but the loss is different. The relationship is different. So therefore, you've got to allow yourself to grieve in the manner which is natural to you. You've also got to allow others to grieve differently. If you feel like crying, cry, go right ahead. If other people are uncomfortable, let them deal with it. Go ahead and do that. When you can laugh, when you can look back and remember the good times and the fun things, do that and share it with others when you can. And do it unashamedly. We do appreciate the opportunity to talk with you here today. Grief sharing. You'll find healing. You'll find that it's Christ-centered. That it's focused on God and His gifts to you. And the way you move forward and the way you heal is by trusting in Him and leaning on others who you'll meet along the way and realizing there'll come a day when others will lean on you. Thank you very much. I do want to mention a couple of things. Jenny, you mentioned the website, um, mm -hmm. reshare.org. And um, can you, I guess part of the question, but also for everyone to understand here, because you can go to the website to find a local group Yes. You can find where it's being held right now. But that, just FYI, uh, at the end of summer, we'll touch faith base, and you'll probably hear something about this rolling out. However, before then, and if not, please check griefshare.org and, and do the little, uh, you know, find a, a grief share group. Uh, there's mm -hmm. an option there. And find a group. It's the first option you get. You name a few. Well, we've got uh, Pinedale Christian Church. And uh, they run it 13 weeks at a time, as it's set up for. And then they'll take 13 weeks off so you can apply what you've actually learned in it. And they also do some social things in between to help, help encourage you. Then they'll do another 13 weeks. Calvary runs theirs a little different. Uh, we were at uh, Pinedale when it first started. That's uh, where we helped for 12 years. We helped start the, the one in Calvary, probably, what was it, Jenny, eight, ten years ago? Something like that. And uh, they meet regularly. So they're both groups. And the one thing that I recommend about those is they have experienced folks in those groups. One of the most beautiful things we see, people come in that are grieving, that can't speak, really are just just at a loss but they come in and they someone comes alongside them that's been through grief and has come through the other side and is available to love on them and to touch their lives and that helps with healing you look at someone else and you say well she's been through this she's doing well I, I can do this and you can so that's where a group with some experienced members in it uh, has an advantage. Yeah, so somebody had mentioned one time uh, just wanting to watch the videos alone. And while you could do that, I think there's real benefit in the chemistry that comes mm -hmm. from a group. You really, you know, you come in broken 
and hurting from your loss, and you hear someone else who is just as broken as you are, or maybe even more so, maybe their loss was more recent, and suddenly you can come outside of your world for a moment and maybe say something encouraging to them, and you haven't been able to do that before, but you're, that's just God using that opportunity Amen. to use the comfort that you've been comforted with to comfort others. So, and one thing I meant to share earlier, one of the most significant things that happened as far as somebody ministering to me a year after Larry had died, I came home uh, back to the States and a friend of mine who I had not seen since college called and said, Jenny, I heard about Larry's loss. I didn't know him. Can we get together? I'm like, yeah, yeah, we'll get together. I was, you know, excited about her call, but I, I didn't know how I wanted to talk about it. It had been a year. Um, but she did the most beautiful thing. She said, tell me about him. She treated him like the present tense. I didn't know. How did you meet? What did you fall in love about with him? What do you miss the most about him? She got me talking about him, and it, it just cheered me up. A lot of people, they want you to be better. Mm -hmm. They want you to have put it in the past. They don't want to hear things like, sometimes I find myself talking to him. I miss him, and I talk to him. Really? That's weird. They tell you that's weird. Well, if that's what comforts you, as long as he's not talking back, you know, <laughs> then you've got another problem. But what ministers to some people and helps them get through is different than what will work for other people. So listen, that was just so therapeutic for me at that time. Somebody who didn't know him, I got to talk about him. And people didn't, you know, she, she didn't think it was weird. Yeah, there was a young couple that had lost a child, and they went back to their Sunday school class. And they talked about how the people looked up and saw them coming, and they scattered. <laughs> they didn't want... It's, it's like, you know, grief is work. It's, it's tough work. And sometimes, like I was telling Jason, the coming to a group and sharing your loss and talking about it helps you accept it. Some are still struggling to accept where they are. Maybe they're now a widow or a widower, or they're an orphan, or they've lost their children or a child. Mm -hmm. Talking about it and being able to speak the words, I lost my husband. You know, you're with people that when you break out into tears, they're just going to cry along with you. They're not going to say, it's, it'll be okay, don't, don't cry. So the being in a group piece, I think, is very important. And listening, because that's what other people are doing when you're speaking. Other people are listening. So thank you for that. But also, depending on the size of the group that comes, we would have breakout groups. I mean, we one session we had 35 people. So, you know, somebody may come with your kids. Well, you don't want to be in the breakout group with your kids. You, the whole reason you're coming sometimes is to really talk about your grief. And you can't do that if your kids are there needing to see you whole and, you know, on top of things. So we wouldn't put your kids in the same group that you would be in to do the discussion piece. Well, thank you again. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you.